Mm -hmm. um, I think there's all sorts of news like school bills that, that will... That will oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> in, 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 Give in them to somebody that. else. <laughs> <laughs> But, oh, welcome to the welcome to the club, mate. <laughs> uh, congratulations, Frank. And I, I, I was sorry to hear that your your daughter's now back in hospital. Is she home again? I, I, no, I no, to... she'll, be, she'll be in there a couple of days, and they, oh. they want twenty. They're going to um, they got to monitor for twenty four hours to make sure that her right. Well, anyway, we, we, down. we wish her the baby. I'm told is going well, so we wish you all well, and it's oh, thank a you. big happy event. Now, Frank. You're here to sing for your supper. Not only are you a grandfather, no, no. But you're the guest, the guest of honour. So, really, I kick it straight to you, um, and uh, uh, good luck. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll just share the screen. If everyone mutes themselves. I think is the first thing. Y yes, please. Okay. All right, that's the first off. Uh, is that just can you just everyone can just mute themselves while the presentation's going. Um, I think the easiest way. Well, um, ask questions is by uh, doing it via the chat. So if you've got any questions, just um, put them in the chat and then I'll read them out at the end of the um, presentation. Don't forget everyone, uh, the meeting is going to be recorded, so be in your best behaviour and uh, it will be put on the uh, website later on. All right, we'll start. Back. All right, well tonight's uh, display or presentation is uh, uh, Rod Perry's uh, large, or it wasn't large, it was a gold medal exhibit on commercial philately in Australia to World War I. The um, bits I'm gonna to present tonight is gonna to be the first 30 pages of the exhibit, which includes the early uh, philatelic traders. And I thought before we start, you know, before I get into the uh, presentation, um, I should you know, give a bit of a background to Rod, you know, our late Rod. Um, Rod was one of the you know, great innovators of philately in Australia. You know, he was always thinking out, outside the square and trying to do promote philately. And so you know, he will be greatly missed. He was an encyclopedia of stamp knowledge and which he always greatly shared with you know, anybody that you, know, you asked him anything in, you know, about philately, especially, especially um, his rates and uh, usages. He was a member of um, the RPSV for 49 years and, then, and just met out, missed out on his 50, you know, 50 years after passing away in, in 2020. What started as a dealer by um, filling club circuits um, sheets you know, for Brighton, for the Telic Society. Um, at 23 years of age, started his um, auction, his, his auction um, House of uh, Rod and the A. Perry Auction Galleries. Um, Rod was a phenomenal traditional, Rod, Rod formed the phenomenal traditional collection of stamps of Victoria. Um, and this was awarded uh, large gold and um, the award of the Grand Prix at the um, 1984 Melbourne International Exhibition. After Rod um, sold his Victoria collection, he's a uh, collecting interests drifted and they drifted towards covers and postal history and uh, Rod's probably uh, one, one of the main uh, dealers who um, revitalized the interest in first day covers and also established um, an interest in usage of stands for the in intended use and often unintended use. All right we'll start in the early years. Um, a paragraph in the uh, Australian Stamp Journal on the 20th of October 1911 had a comment on it that says, so far as Australia is concerned, there are gentlemen who assert that they began philately as far as 1863. The, the letter on the, um, on the right dated 1863 corroborates this claim referencing stamp collecting in Victoria. And I'll read you a couple of paragraphs from the left because you can't read it on the screen. And it's, you know, the, the, the writer stated, I'm collecting foreign stamps for Miss Wentworth. If you should happen to meet with any you don't want, I should, I should feel extremely obliged if you would send them. And then in the postscript, I had a few lines to say that 
that I have received your very kind letter and also the Melbourne Post, for which I thank you very much. I was much pleased with the foreign stamps and any more you can send and really <laughs> send that you really don't want will be great to gratefully accepted. Now, um, the, the letter was addressed to uh, an RJ Sinkock, and at the time, RJ Sinkock was only 15 years old, and he only lived another five more years. Mm. All right. So the earliest advertisement that appeared for uh, for uh, stamps was uh, on. 19th of May, 1965, in, in the edition of the Perth Gazette and West Australian Times, and it contained the following wanted to buy advertisement. Uh, it says, wanted to purchase or exchange old Western Australian stamps, used and especially unused. Present issues also bought or exchanged. And the advertiser was a Melbourne solicitor, George W. Barnes. So we can see from the these couple of, um, you know, Items that to service the, the, the to service the flat the, the oh, sorry to service a steadily growing demand for philatelic material. The Australian colonies from late eighteen sixties, the philatelic trade as the activity has started already. Also, you know, the colonial post offices, you know, they were suppliers of philatelic material. Um, they were the first suppliers actually, and um, and they had an effective monopoly. They were supplying stamps to you know, to the fledging new issue of services abroad from the early 1860s. And as can be seen with the uh, Postmaster General's uh, envelope there, in 1873, um, the, <coughs> sorry, the, the cover is, is uh, that is 9th December 1873, um, and it was registered to William Lincoln, who was a commissioner agent and a dealer in foreign stamps, in, in the um, in dealer in foreign and colonial stamps. And then we come to the pioneer, you know, leading, leading contemporary philatelic traders. Um, Buckley, Blomson and Co. in Sydney, New South Wales, have probably got the, uh, the title of being the earliest professional philatelic traders. Um, they had come on the scene in 1870. It was, it was formed by Edward Buckley and Edward Lomson, claimed to have been established in 1870, like I said, in Sydney. Buckley is actually recorded as being in business in the late 1860s. Lumsden was advertised in his own right to buy and sell stamps as early as 1870. Uh, the firm in 1879 perhaps, perhaps published Australia's first philatelic journal, New South Wales Stamp Collectors Magazine. And when at 6 Bly Street, Sydney, they traded as the Sydney Foreign um, Stamp Depot. And as can be seen um, in that, that top uh, example is, is an 1881 innovative address label, which has the Sydney Foreign Stamp Depot simulating um, a contemporary stamp album. In March, in March 1882, the business was sold to uh, Dawson A. Rindon. And if you, I don't know if you can see it, see the, um, the ad in the Sydney, you know, Sydney News in New South Wales, Agriculture with Grazia, but Buckley placed this advertisement. And you can see, it says, Ed Edward Buckley, and says, Lake Buckley, Blumsden and Co, 6 Bly Street, Sydney. So kind of leads me to believe that um, the partnership between Buckley and Blumson had already been uh, kind of in on, on, on the rocks. Then we come to our doors to Vinden. Um, Vinden had been apprenticed to Buckley and Blumson and Young by not 1880. By March 1882, Dawson Vinden um, at, at the age of uh, 14 become the firm's um, new proprietor. Mm -hmm. And with the ac acquisition um, came, the, came the publication of the New South Wales Collectors Magazine, which um, he later renamed Vinden's Philatelic Monthly. 
And as, as you can see, there's a, there's, there's a picture of uh, Dawson Winden at age 24. And the bottom envelope is a uh, bottom cover is a registered cover from Petrovsk in, um, in Poland, and which was simply addressed to Dawson A. Winden, Sinden, New South Wales. Uh, I don't, I don't think it would have got there today. Well, well Dawson Vinden, by, by 1983, Vinden had relocated from Bly Street to uh, Change Alley in Circular Quay. And, and as can be seen with um, the, the top uh, envelope with the hand stamp on Circular Quay address. Um, by 1888, Vinden had closed the city office and relocated to his res residence at 5 Harbourview Terrace, Cascade. Street Pennington, which he named Philatalia. Hang on, just I think someone's trying to come in. I don't know. So that. Uh, right, by 1888, Winden had closed, and then you can see the, um, the postcard down about address to Harborview Terrace you know, in Paddington, Paddington to DA Winden Esquire. Hmm. In late 1889, Vinden returned to the city, opening up a shop at 11 Victoria Arcade, 74 Elizabeth Street, trading as Dawson, A. Vinden and Co. And um, there's, a, there's a photo of um, Victoria Arcade, Sydney, as it would have probably appeared in um, in 1890s. No, there's no cars parked in front of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dawson Vinden, by, by February 18, 1891, the firm added the shop next door. So he had nine and 11 Victoria Arcade. Um, and that can be shown, shown that in the um, top, co the top cover is uh, addressed to uh, 11 Victoria Arcade. And then the bottom cover, the address has changed to nine and 11 Victoria Arcade. Um, in 1891, Vinden would be joined um, by the infamous Fred Hagen as partner. In um, the 1st of October, 1893, Vinden Philatelic Monthly, Fred had become, uh, it was announced that Fred, Fred Hagen had become the sole proprietor of DA Vinden and Co. And it's interesting to say, the notice said, I have this day disposed of my interest in the firm of DA Vinden and Co. My late partner, Mr. Fred Hagen, will carry on the business of the, therefore receiving all debts due and discharging all liabilities in connection therewith. I'm proceeding to London on the 27th to open stamp business in my own separate account, but will act as sole European agent for the Sydney firm and will be also regularly contributing to the monthly. And I may add that any Australian business will be consolidated Conjunction with the conducted in conjunction with the Sydney firm. Then down at the bottom, um, he's advertising. He's asking photos of all his philatelic friends so he can put it on put it on the board in his office in London. All right, then we come to Fred Hagen. And as you know, no, um, part, he was partnered on 25th of July '9 with Dawson O. Ridden Co. His business. Um, had descended from um, Sydney Sealy's for the tradings, Buckley, Bonson and Co. And then and um, then he became the sole proprietor of Wyndham and Co. on 1st of October, 1891. On the top uh, uh, real photo autograph greetings card of Fred Hagen, um, it, was in, it was in his early 40s. And the recipient of, um, of this card was C.A. Giles, was a pioneer philatelist and contributor to Wyndham's Philatelic Monthly under the non diploma of CA. So I don't, don't know if any of you remember <laughs> that far, but I don't. Um, and then the bottom cover is um, dated the 27th of September 1904, which, is, which was uh, sent to the US showing um, the corner inscription in use by a Dawson named Wyndham Co. revised to reflect Hagen as a tra you know, sole trader in his own right.
in August, I knew Hagen had published his list of um, cash paid for use Australian auction stamps. And, and, um, and in this, he, cl he claimed to be the largest wholesale and retail stamp dealer in Australasia. And uh, I don't know, don't know how what come about this, but you know, it's, it's in pretty pristine condition, even when I'm on, on the scan. Uh, or months after acquire, acquiring acquiring the Vinden interests and Vinden's Philatelic Monthly, uh, Fred, ha Fred Hagen renamed the journal the Australian Philatelist, and the inaugural issue appeared in um, August 1894. And this was it was destined to become the dominant force in Australian Philatelist for the next three decades. Um, In, in the advertisement on the right, there's, there's, a, there's a combined advertisement for the Australian Philatelist and Fred Hagen Limited, which appeared um, in the Philatelic Society of New Zealand, 1911, annual report. Uh, in 1902, Fred Hagen produced a professional illustrated catalogue, which is um, illustrated there. Yeah, there. Um, and then in 1905, Hagen um, incorporated his business as Fred Hagen Limited following the acquisition of um, J.H. Smyth & Co, which I'll uh, say a bit more, more about later. By 1911, Hagen had moved to 182 Pitt Street and um, Hagen used these uh, seals on the back of his envelopes. And, um, and uh, there's a few collectors out there that are collect these seals and try try to get you know what all the different printings and uh and Rod had a few of them and uh, the ones I'm showing here is the two that um stood out and uh, the one the one the, the top one is the red seal which is dated uh, January in 9, 1911 which is the earliest use of the red seal and the bottom one is, is the usage of the uh, blue seal dated not 3rd of March 1913 and which was introduced in 1912. And I don't think, don't think I've seen an earlier one. There could be one earlier, but I haven't seen one. But Frank Hagen became, became um, the Australasian, Australasian agent for Stanley Gibbons um, in 1913. And by 1915, Hagen had moved to 66 King Street in um, Sydney. And um, as you can see, he advertised uh, being the agent for Stanley Gibbons uh, on his uh, perforation gauge. All right, then we come to Smyth and Nickel. Um, Smyth and Nickel was a partnership between uh, J.H. Smyth and T.H. Nickel. They were trading from um, Hunter Street in Sydney. Um, competitors, they were, you know, competitors were Vinden and Hagen, and both, and, and both of the firms. Um, published a journal and lavish catalogue. So, you yeah, know, I think in those, in those early days, it was a, it was a big business and, and especially uh, if you uh, produced catalogues and uh, journals. The top photo is a, is a photo of Hunter Street, Sydney, in the centre building in 1933 when it was occupied by Hall, Hall and um, co photographers. And um, in all probability, the premises were probably largely unchanged and, you know, from the Smyth and Nickel days. The bottom cover dated 11th, November 1895 is an upgraded use of a New South Wales 3D uh, registered envelope to Scotland, showing a double oval um, Smyth and Nickel 14 Hunter Street, Sydney um, hand stamp at the left. In 1989, Smyth and Nickel published the first in their series of price catalogue of, of Australian stamps. There's an illustration of the first one. Smyth and Nickel were one of the two philatelic traders at the 1900 Sydney Philatelic Exhibition, the other being Fred Hagen. You can see the illustration of the stand which appeared in um, the Australasian Journal of Philately. And there was a comment um, made in the journal that, uh, there, was, that there was there was there was two two philately traders at the exhibition, and the other the other traders' commission was very very much smaller than ours, 
that was that was written by Martha Nicholas. <laughs> right, during the 1900s, Smith and Nichols graduated from hand stamp to uh, printed stationery. And um, as you can see, the 16th of August envelope, the top envelope was um, an oval, the oval hand stamp and then the uh, printed one down the bottom from 1901. Um, James um, Smith and Nichols ceased to be partners in 1902. Uh, Nichols stayed at 14 Hunter Street and Smith relocated to 88 King Street, Sydney, and traded as J. J. H. Smith & Co. Um, Smith appears to have been uh, more focused on philatelic publishing than trading. That, as can be seen, this, the 1902 edition of the uh, Ice Catalogue um, as, as the name changed the label for the new entity, J. H. Smith & Co. You know, the 1903 um, edition of the Illustrated Plies catalog had the giants, J. H. Smith & Co. Um, heading. And here, here is a um, copy of a letter that in 1904, that J. H. Smythe signed to a recalcitrant client. And uh, in, in summary, they, they sent out you know, a book of stamps to the value of 21 pounds and they hadn't received received any money or any response for about four months. So <laughs> no wonder they was writing a letter. And I think 28 pounds in those days would have been a lot of money. J.S. Smith, um, in around 1911, relocated to um, Castle Ash Street in Sydney. And to 50 Castle Ash, and then after the war, he um, relocated to 121A Castle Ash Street. And um, that is the um, photo of um, 121A, which, um, which had the J.S. Smith uh, limited uh, advertising. Well, upon the death of Smythe in 1923, uh, employee Miss Edith West became um, director. Um, and then two years later, Romney Gibbons joined the firm as, as a director as well. Both um, Gibbons and West you know, had, prior, had prior, prior backgrounds in um, Philately, uh, extending to 1901 in the case of West. Um, Miss West retired in 1951 and near uh, and the firm was acquired by uh, Mrs. Baker and Maloney for the priceless sum of ten thousand dollars, and ran the in in, in, in uh, literature it says the, the the reason they came over ten thousand dollars is um that's all they had in the bank at that time. Um, they, uh, I've illustrated the Miss E West um, card, and on the card it says. I don't know if you can read it. It says, upwards of seven years experience, two years with Mrs. Smythe and Nickel, three years with Mrs. Mrs. J. H. Smythe and Co., and two years with Miss Fred Haken Limited, during which time I have been almost continually handling and studying Australian stamps. And then, and, and, this, and, and this next paragraph is very interesting. It says, for the past two years, I have had charge of the retail Australian stock of Mrs. Mr. Fred Hagen Limited, I took an active part to the preparation of the firm's latest catalogue and a large proportion of Australian stamps sent out on approval were prepared by me. In addition, I've mounted a large number of stamps. And then the last round is for seven years, I've been a short, shorthand writer and typist. And during that period, the majority of letters signed by Mr. J.S. Smith were typewritten by me. So it leads you to think that letter that was previous letter, that letter, you know, maybe it wasn't signed by J.S. Well, it could have been signed by Miss West. All right, and Thomas Nicol, um, the other partner of Smith and Nicol, remained at 14 Hunter Street for at least a decade. Uh, Nicol was amongst a few early philatelic traders to provide correspondence in French and German to overseas markets, as, as can be seen on the um, envelope there. Um, and the cover on the right, uh, contain you know would have contained probably uh, current offers of uh, price lists. Uh, 
But Nick, Nick will uh, promoted his uh, or, you know, took a theme, and you know the theme was the Chiefs stamps were promoted. You know, for, you know, and this this kind of theme was you know um, promoted for at least a decade, and as can be seen on the envelopes, got Chiefs stamps. This is 1911 envelope, and then in 1917 he was continuing with his uh, cheap stamps with, with um, mantra, you know, with his 19 in the 1917 price list. And that can be, you know, you, I don't think you guys can read it, but it's, it says in one of the um, offers it's 168 shillings for 12 20 shilling kangaroo blue and brown, and five shillings. Per ten thousand or one D King George fifth red stamp, which means you know could so maybe you know, maybe there was some truth in his advertising. And here, here, um, here we, we um, just illustrated um, the, the nineteen twelve um, illustrated price list, which was published after Nickel were located to one hundred and five um, Pitt Street in Sydney. As can be seen. All these dealers, I must have, they moved so, so many times, I don't know how, how they kept track of their stock. All right, well, all the previous dealers are all Mel um, Sydney dealers, and now we come to a couple of Melbourne, or a few Melbourne dealers. I think the since in those early early years, Sydney would have been the hub of the Philately, and there, was, and there wasn't as much de dealers in uh, Melbourne. Um, the, the, the earliest dealer in Melbourne was Charles Bobble Dunn, who claimed that he not that in his who claimed his 1909 catalogue to be the oldest established and the most reliable dealer in postage stamps in Victoria, and he claimed that he has been established you know that he was established in 1878. But Dunn was originally at 59. Elizabeth Street, Melbourne, and um, the cover on top is an 1887 cover. This is a 2D envelope when um, Dunn was at 59 Elizabeth Street. And um, this was addressed to um, a Tasmanian philatelic trader, E. Granville Miller, in Launceston. And then around 1899, Dunn relocated to 346 Holland Street, Melbourne. And the postcard at the bottom, dated 16th of February, 1899, was signed by Dunn when at 346 Little Collins Street and was addressed to a pioneer for that was Reverend H.W. Lane of Lara, Victoria. I don't know if any of you guys know any, any of these for that list. And then we could probably come to one of the more infamous Melbourne dealers, uh, William Ackland, who migrated from the UK to, to Melbourne in um, 1895 at the age of 20. Within a year, he bought the business of Wallace Stamp Company, which was established in 1890, which was established in 1890. And um, they were a UK, a, a UK for, firm, which had, had, had um, an office, or, you know, had a retail store in Melbourne. Ackland was one of the foremost um, Australian philatelic traders, publishing his own extensive price catalogue as well. And he was he was the senior member of the uh, of the charter or senior charter member of the Australian Stamp Dealers Association, which was founded in 1948, which is my which is APTA. And, and there's a um, photo of Ackland in his in his late life, and also. Um, then it was a perforation grade, which was inscribed for William Ackland and supplied by peerless hinges. And uh, Ackland um, used a lot of peerless um, uh, hinges, perforation gauges, um, plastic envelopes, and things like that. Ackland resided in South Fiera initially, but and traded, you know, from a GP, or traded as a GPO box. Melbourne, and then in later in, in the later part of the eighteen nineties, Ackland relocated to one hundred and sixty to Elizabeth Street, Melbourne. The top cover uh, is a hand stamp with his, with his GPO box, Melbourne, eighteen ninety three, and the bot and the bottom cover is uh, a hand stamp with his one hundred with, with his Elizabeth Street address. A 
we're well, back in the early 1900s, we relocated to from 162, from 162 Elizabeth Street to Collin, 267 Collins Street. And there's examples of some, you know, stamp packets, pocket stock books, and glass and packets in use at the new location. Don't know if the dealers still use pocket stock books. <laughs> sell pocket stock books to people. All right, in early 1928, Ackland relocated to the um, Alston's building at the corner of Collins in Elizabeth Street, Melbourne. Um, and there's a photo of the, um, the Alston building. Uh, Ackland trained for this, from this building for decades, you know, and uh, even, you know, talking to Rod in his you know, early days, he said, you know, and he used to go in there when he was, you know, in 1959, he went in there to buy, to, to go and buy a stock book. And um, he ended up coming out, with, you know, a lot more than a stock book. <laughs> so Ackland must have been a good salesman. And that brings us to the end of the uh, presentation. Thank you all guys for um, listening. And I'll, uh, I would like to thank um, Richard Jasmine uh, for allowing the RPSV access to the exhibit. Um, Richard purchased the exhibit from the Rob Perry estate. And um, his ulterior motive was um, to not have the uh, exhibit broken up. You know, if, if it was, a lot of the philatelic trade of history would have been would have been lost. Um, and the whole exhibit will be uh, eventually be available on the uh, on the website when I finish scanning the 128 pages. All right, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Well. Well done. Now, I would just like to say just a few words, uh, echoing the comments about Rod. Uh, July this year, Rod would have made his 50 years of, of, of membership. Um, it's our plan to have a 50-year membership lunch in the middle of the year, and we will certainly be, be noting Rod. He won't be one of the people, obviously, that we'll be specifically honouring, but uh, there'll be an honourable mention of his his role and his, his near... 50 year membership. Um, that's an opportunity just to say, by the way, that uh, social events like the 50 year memberships um, and the uh, um, Bourse are going to go to the middle of the year because we just think it's safer that uh, by then a lot of vaccinations will have occurred. And we just feel that the idea of social functions where the whole essence is of people getting slightly closer than 1.5 meters um, um, will be much safer by the middle of the year. So that's the plan. But that's an, an aside. I've got, found it interesting that Rod, who I imagine has collected this right through his collecting era, because it would have taken a long time to, to have assembled. Um, the fact that he's got covers, um, he's got ads, he's got um, uh, perforation gauges, catalogues, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, shows the breadth of what he was digging up, and obviously following the philatelic trade, and obviously he was a, a, a great student of it. Um, I think it's something that's very good that it's going to be kept together in in one piece, and you've only seen a small part of it presented by Frank, who went to a, a lot of trouble. By the way, Frank, a couple of your years were out by 100, but um, <laughs> okay. you're putting 19 instead of 1895. But uh, uh, we all knew what you meant, so it's not a, not a problem. And your pedant like me would have picked you up on it. <laughs> um, but one of the questions that comes to me out of what we've seen was the gap between the 1860s and then the 1880s. So that's a, a question. I don't know whether there's up more material. And Frank, in a minute, you might want to answer about that. Um, and the other thing is that nearly all, all the illustrations and like and the focus was on, on, on Australian states material. Um, pretty well all the catalogues have had state stamps uh, featuring on their covers and the like and the, and the references, a lot of the, their ads referred to Australian stamps. There were references to foreign as well um, but uh, it, it'd be interesting to know what, what were the interests of people in those days, because from a lot of the albums that I've seen, the objective of people was I'll get try to get one of everything from around the world. And that, of course, was a slightly credible objective in those days, no longer. But I, I thoroughly I, I enjoyed it. I'm interested that, that Melbourne seemed to be slightly 
later than Sydney. I wonder what, what, whether there's a why or wherefore of, of why that might have been. Um, but uh, certainly Sydney's got into it very early in the piece. And of course, collections like the Vickery Collection, which were formed, um, I think, around the 1900s. I think, I don't know whether Ian yep. Greg knows better uh, uh, about the 1900s. Uh, yep. Phenomenal collection. And if anyone goes to the Powerhouse Museum, um, whilst it's still at, 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 um, um, in Ultimo, um, you can get a chance to try to visit it by a prior arrangement. But uh, the collection that she made, no doubt with the help of these dealers, uh, was absolutely fantastic. The, the quality of the Mauritius is, uh, blows your mind. So, Frank, you've gone to a lot of trouble selecting out of that material. We've got quite a bit of it up our sleeve. It's, go it's good that the, the entirety of it will go on to, onto the website. But Frank, you've gone to a lot of trouble uh, producing it for us. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of us for going, going to that trouble. Um, so, and I will, by the way, speak directly to Richard, who I think at the moment should be in Tasmania, but whether, or after what happened last week, whether he is in Tasmania, I don't know. Um, and thank him on everyone's behalf for giving us access to this material and the ability to show it and to put it onto our website. Anyway, Frank, if people can join me if, whether in the privacy of their home or whether they want to unmute mute themselves and, and thank Frank in the usual way. John, uh, could you. I just say something about Rod Perry? I, I have a feeling that Rod um, got Charles Lesky and Gary Watson off on the track of um, the, um, doing the stamps. I think they joined Rod in the very early days. I think I, I know Gary Watson did. Yeah, I'm pretty because, certain um, Charles Lesky did yeah, too. Because um, I I took Gary to the, to uh, Bill Wells' funeral and we we're talking about Rod in the car, and um, Gary 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 was a um, it was a lawyer, and um, he, he got he got offered a position to do um, conveyancing, and uh, he didn't like doing conveyancing, so he. He preferred to do stamps, and he had an interview <laughs> with Rob Perry, and had, a, had an interview with Rob Perry. And two weeks later, he went on a, on, on a conference to Hawaii, and when he came back, he had a phone call from Rod saying that he, you know, he got the job, and um, and, he, his, and Gary's been in flatly ever since. Got a lot to answer for, then, hasn't he? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good and bad. Uh, I can remember going to Rod's shop just off the Burke Street in Mellon, 1970, 71 or something, when I was at still secondary school. Yeah, that's when he started his auction house, yeah. auction in 1971. It must have been 69, 70, then I went to his shop. Little, little room he had. It was interesting to me when you went to a stamp exhibition, you'd find Rod there, this is in, talking in this, in a very recent uh, time, and he'd have a big box of, of covers in front of him, and he was as happy as a sandman. Oh, yeah. He thoroughly enjoyed flicking through, and he would find amazing things inside it. Um, but uh, yeah, he enjoyed his flatly right to the end, so that was wonderful. Any other uh, uh, comments? Now, what I, th I think what Ian Sadler did ask the question about what was the focus for collecting in those albums and I, I, I try to it was, most, it was mostly it was mostly colonies yeah some, some had Fiji Tonga and things like that but it was mostly colonies in Australia in Pacific Islands yeah yeah can I just uh, say a few things yes Please. please. Uh, during the meeting I had a phone call for my son so my, I had an unstable internet connection for a fair portion of that since then so I guess I should switch my phone right off while I'm watching these. But um, a couple of things. I can remember going to William Ackland's shop, which was next to the TNG building. I think it was in Collins Street up near the... Yeah, that, was, that, that would have been 267 Collins Street. Was it? Okay. And I know going in there, this is back in the about 1965 or thereabouts, and I bought a change the subject now, I bought a uh, Victorian centenary florin, it was about uncirculated, 
didn't know much about them, but I just wanted to buy something good. And I remember him saying, oh, I, was, I suppose you'll want the Foy's bag as well. I didn't know what the Foy's bag was, but I said, yeah, oh, yes, please, you know. Then uh, when I got home, I put the Foy's bag in a book so I wouldn't lose it and the coin somewhere else. Well, later on, I thought, this Foy's bag, that's bloody rubbish, so I just tore it up. <laughs> and that's worth a few hundred dollars alone without the coin. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, the coin got stolen later on, but that doesn't matter. Uh, Charles Lesky. When I worked at, in the bank at Monash University from 1969 to 72, Keith Carnegie, who was an old member of the Royal, he was the travel officer out there. So he and I used to talk stamps at lunchtime and that. And the Monash Stamp Club used to meet out there in the auditorium or somewhere. And Charles was the convener of it. So he's been going into stamps since the late 60s anyway. So, yeah, a bit more history, a bit more history. Yes, yes. that's all that's that. Now, any other questions? Um, there, there was one pointing out that we had the Vindens catalogues in our library. I think Alan yeah. uh, Shatton pointed that out, so that certainly is true. Um, any other comments? I'd like to know what that la the building in the last slide was. Building in the last slide. Okay, hang on, I'll bring it up. Is it still there? Yeah. It's right on the corner of Elizabeth and, and uh, Colin. Yes. State 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 phone shop. Yeah, it's on the corner. Yeah. Can... Hello? Yeah. Hang on, it'll come back. Yep. <laughs> That one. Back. Uh, that one. Back. There that we go. One. That's, That's the cool. Alston's building corner of Collins and Elizabeth Street, and it's still there. Yep. Yep. Is it? Yes. Now they always say, they say in Melbourne, you should look up to Melbourne, and then we will happily walk with our heads down at the bottom of that building. Because um, I, I did, I did, a, I did a Google thing on a when I was when I was putting this together to see, you know. If it was, yeah, if it was still there, and it is still there, and it doesn't doesn't look much different, other than it's got a few big tall buildings on the other side of it now. <laughs> it's still there, is it? Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, Good you heaven. should look up around Melbourne. The, the you go walking around all the cityscape, and it's just magnificent. I can remember being taken up to uh, Mr. Ackland's uh, stamp shop when I was a kid. By my father, uh, still the same building, back about the first or second floor up. Yeah, that's wonderful. Mm. Yeah. I have a couple of points, if I may. Ian. I've gone off to you, Ken. Ian, why don't you go and we'll come back to Ken. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, I have well, two. Co one's a comment and one's a question. Um, I was very rudely trying to find something. I don't know whether you can see this, but. Um, that's to Ackland Company. It's the only recorded AR cover for Victoria. Oh. Wow. Yeah, which is quite okay. interesting. I can send you a scan if it's of interest, uh, Frank. Yes, please. Um, the, the, the question I have is, um, and I, one of the other things I was desperately trying to find, because I can't remember the exact name, uh, Davis and Company, dealers in Melbourne. Are you familiar with them? They had a square. Yes, it is. They're, they're, yeah, they were they're, they're in South Melbourne. They moved right. a lot. They moved a lot. Okay. Was, what, uh, what happened to them in around about 19, 12, 13, something like that? Yeah. Don't know. Did I they don't close know. down? Yeah, they closed down, I think. Do you know why? Don't know why. Um, Howard Davis, he worked, mo he was mostly. That's right. Um, yep. He was mostly, okay. he was mo he was mostly um, like a sole trader and he worked. Virtually worked mostly from home. So every time, every time he's, he changed his uh, home address, his business address <laughs> changed. Okay. Well, I can. Uh, there's a very interesting information about this, and I would be interested if anyone has anything further. I'll take my hand down. Um, when he, this is very recent, and I don't know how many people know about this, and I don't know the full story. But when he died, 
all his stock was shipped over to the UK. And it's been in someone's attic until the last three or four years. Oh, <laughs> and in the last three or four years, vast quantities of yeah. uh, Victorian material of the postage yeah. period have been coming on the market. Large blocks of Perf 11 and the double Perfs, in Perfs and all sorts of things. And I am told that the very elderly gentleman who only died last year, who inherited all this material, had been shipping it out of his attic in bulk. And it, being, it was being selling, sold on eBay. It was sold through dealers in, in the UK. And a lot of it is coming up in auction. And then Gary is around somewhere. Gary, I don't, are you aware of this? And have you, um, uh, were you aware of this? It's very interesting because there are large blocks of threepenny, late threepenny, double perfs, yep. uh, perf elevens. A lot of the, lot of the so-called rubbish material that came out of the Melbourne of the Victorian Post Office at the very end during 1912. All the stuff that they'd held back because it was damaged or semi-damaged seems to have got into um, this, this gentleman's stock, and it's been sitting there for donkey's years and has okay. only just come to market. I don't know yeah. if anyone else had observed this and oh, I've got this through a number of yeah. British dealers who have actually been dealing with this material yeah, and I actually you. saw the stock yeah, book have of... Gary, Gary's reaction to that? Yeah. Sorry, well I just say I, I actually saw the stock book of the postage due material which had large blocks of cancel to order values which I actually acquired from the stock book but Gary I don't know whether you know anything about this or whether it can add anything. Uh, I've seen it some some things come onto the market, and I was wondering where has this been hiding? Um, yep. And there's the answer. Exactly. I've never seen some of these things before. No, they, they, they've only literally come on the market. Clearly, uh, they weren't recorded earlier. Um, I think this is where some of the double perfs on the Tuppany Halfpenny value postage have come from, yes. because I think they're all from this source. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ian. Okay, over to Ken Scudder, please. Ken, have you unmuted yourself? Yeah, no, okay, I've unmuted myself, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, what do you want to say? What do you oh, want to I comment? You wanted to ask something. I want to ask something. I thought you did. That's, that's no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I like a comment, though. I'd, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, there was one dealer in town that I remember going to. They're closed down now, but I can't remember their name. Um, they weren't mentioned there. Uh, no, there's, there's, many well, years. Well, sorry. Go on. Depends on how old Rod's, you are. Rod's got, Rod's got uh, 65 pages of, <laughs> of other individual dealers that are, that's for next time. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I ought to reserve the comment. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Ken. Their name then. But I enjoyed, no, I just let's say I, I thoroughly enjoyed this uh, meeting, especially as I can't normally get up to a Thursday evening meeting. But I hope to get along to the next day meeting. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay, well, let's it, we'll just revert back to the the, uh, the uh, agenda, such as we have, which is all very cursory in these in this situation. The minutes of these meetings will be uh, addressed when we can do that. Uh, we've got a new um, member, um, Dr. Susie. No, I won't, won't pronounce this correctly. Sirathran, which sounds like a, a, a Sri Lankan uh, um, name. Um, and Dr. Susie uh, appeared at the day meeting the other day. It was, uh, she converted her membership into, into attendance in about the shortest time that I can ever remember. But uh, <laughs> so that was wonderful that we, that we saw her. Oh, yeah. The head of forthcoming events. Uh, towards the end of the month, two things are happening. Firstly, on the 27th, the library uh, is going to be open. Um, I see no reason, or we uh, see no reason why that can't go ahead. And Richard Brecken is certainly uh, going to be participating in that. So the library will be open. And the other thing that happens at the end of February should be the issue of philately from Australia. That's been part of the glue that's been keeping us together over this difficult year that, uh, that's gone by. So look forward to the next edition of philately from Australia. 
Um, then on the 2nd of March, uh, Graham Plaw, uh, Australia, this is a day meeting, sorry, on a KGV on cover. Um, the Postal History Group is on the 10th of March at 7.45, delayed mail, um, and that will include censorship. So anyone who uh, would like to offer censorship items, that would be there. But uh, any other ways that mail has been delayed, um, that would be uh, uh, welcome on that evening. But uh, anyone who's been to the Postal History Group knows how flexible we are, and we will accept m many, many things under many guises. Within well, limits. I'm sorry. Within limits. <laughs> on the 18th, on the 18th of March, the philatelic meeting, Gary Diffin, Australian Colonial Mail, the return to steam, and I'm really looking forward to that one because it's a sort of a period that uh, that uh, overlaps my area of interest. So, Gary, we look forward to see, seeing you on the, hopefully, if all goes well and uh, COVID permitting, but. Uh, um, I'm very hopeful that our government will, will see the way that uh, any further outbreaks are handled in a slightly different way to the last one. But anyway, that's a political statement and I don't mean that for a minute. <laughs> um, I mentioned that the bourse has been delayed. Um, oh, I should also mention on the 15th of March, the Australian Philatelic Society is asked to have access to our building. Ian Sadler has asked this and we've been only too pleased to say that they are very welcome. Uh, it's on the evening of the 15th at 7.45 and John Young is presenting Australian Express Mail. And Ian, I believe it's true to say that guests would be welcome on that evening. Um, but if they should contact you first, that would be, be ideal. But I'm uh, very glad that you can use, use the building. Well, that's all that I have. Before I close, um, any, any comments from the floor, any uh, other items that people would like to raise? By the way, I think we only made 19, so. <laughs> yeah, didn't get 20. No, uh, but still we had people that we were certainly would not have had if we were meeting in the premises. That, so that, that's, yeah, that's, right. Right. that's, that's good. a good result. It's a good result. We had 20 for a couple of months. Sorry, where was that voice from? That... That's less. Yeah. That you, Lester? Yeah. yeah, I had 20 on my screen for a short period of time. Yeah, we had 20 for a short period of time because it was a late comer. Okay, well, that's it. So, Lester, Ian, thank you very much for attending. We're very glad that everyone attended, but uh, people who, who un unusual hours attend are particularly welcome. So, thank you all for coming, and I hope you've enjoyed your evening. And I would like to say tea and coffee is available, and I think I can on this occasion say that. <laughs> with, 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 or something harder, if you wish. Or a glass Come of wine. On. John, yep. can I just make one final comment? Yep. Uh, I think Ian Gregg should be congratulated on having not one but two elephants in the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I've also got, I've also got um, uh, emu eggs, if you see. Oh, I used to have an emu egg, but I don't know what happened to it. It probably, <laughs> probably Ian's place. It hatched. <laughs> it might have hatched out and kicked your dunny down. <laughs> well, I must say, I had it in England and it disappeared when we came to Australia, so possibly it is the same one. <laughs> it didn't survive. Okay. On that, on, on that humorous note, thank you all for coming and I hope you've enjoyed your evening. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.